Hello, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. I attended this conference last year and I learned a huge amount and I can see we have a great um, schedule planned for today, so I'm looking forward to it as well. I'm a newcomer to the world of macular dystrophy research. I've worked in the field of osteoarthritis for the last 15 years, trying to understand what happens in our joints as we age. So you're probably asking yourself what osteoarthritis has in common with macular dystrophy. And there are many differences between these two conditions, but there are also some similarities. And I'd like to tell you about um, work in my group on osteoarthritis and how we think um, what we've learned in osteoarthritis might help us understand some of the underlying processes in um, macular dystrophy, uh, both Sorsby macular dystrophy and age-related macular dystrophy. All of our uh, tissues are made up of many different kinds of specialized cells. And some of those cells are specialized to help us see, some of them are specialized to trans transport blood around the body. Despite all the different functions, cells have some um, properties in common. So despite all their differences, there's some things they do the same. And one of the common features that cells have is that they all make new building blocks and then when they don't need them anymore, they break them down and recycle them. So whether it's the cells in your knee or the cells in your retina, you can think of cells as the cells in a tissue as being houses in a neighborhood. So within each of those cells, within each of those houses, there's similar processes going on. So in each house, there'll be processes like cooking and cleaning, perhaps some DIY to refresh the kitchen, and that just makes the um, house keep uh, refreshed and, and um, everything is, is new and in the right place at the right time. So this const continual recycling and, and making and breaking down is what keeps our cells healthy. So in, in healthy tissue, the breaking down of old components is balanced with the making of new components. And it's this equilibrium that keeps the tissue healthy. In osteoarthritis, this balance is tipped towards breakdown. So there's too much breaking down of old components. Uh, there is still making of new components, but there's more breaking down that happens. And this breaking down of the old components is what leads to joint damage. Uh, and that's what causes the pain and difficulties with movement. So what causes osteoarthritis? We know that one of the key risk factors is aging. And for a long time, we thought that getting arthritis was just inevitable as we aged. So in the same way that a car tire breaks down with use, we thought that our cartilage just wore down over the years of using it. But we don't um, think this anymore. So we don't think that osteoarthritis is inevitable. And the reason for that is because we've learned about other ways in which joint damage can occur. So for example, sports injuries, like if for example, you tear a ligament in the knee, that really increases your risk of getting osteoarthritis later. So what that has taught us is that the real cause of osteoarthritis is changes in the mechanics of the joint, either changes in the way the bones move relative to each other, or it can be changes in the muscles surrounding a joint. But these alter the mechanics of the joint and that leads to changes in the structure of the bone and the cartilage layer that makes our joint move smoothly. So if we look at a normal uh, joint, at the end of the bones, we have a layer of cartilage and that helps the, the bones move smoothly relative to each other. And one of the key features of osteoarthritis is that this cartilage layer breaks down and that makes the bone ends rub against each other. And that's what causes the pain and the difficulties with movement. So scientists have studied this breakdown process in cartilage in detail. And what they found is that the breakdown is mainly caused by the activity of a group of proteins called proteases. And these are enzymes that um, break down proteins. So they're responsible for that recycling step. They chop up other proteins so that they can be recycled. And this process is uh, very important for normal tissue turnover. So it's important for things like wound healing. So when you cut yourself in order to heal that wound, these proteases help um, turn over the old components so that they can be replaced with new fresh ones. So proteases are really important in healthy um, wound healing. But if there's too much of these proteases, then they can chop up the tissue too much. 
And if there's too much uh, of this chopping up of components, that can lead to damage and diseases such as osteoarthritis. So my research is largely focused on a protein called tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases 3, and we abbreviate that to TIM3. It's um, easier to remember um, its name. And TIM3 is a, a protein that blocks the activity of these proteases. And by doing that, it's able to protect cartilage. So the cells in our cartilage make uh, TIM3 and release it. And in the environment around the cell, this TIM3 molecule will then interact with the proteases and it blocks them from interacting with the proteins they would normally chop up. So by doing this, uh, TIM3 is able to protect the cartilage from the activity of these proteases. Research published in 2010 showed that this TIM3 protein is lost in osteoarthritis. So uh, an image from this paper on the right shows the TIM3 protein as uh, two black uh, lines. And we can see that as the disease gets worse, uh, people have less TIM3 in their cartilage. Interestingly, we saw that there was no difference in the amount of instructions that the cells make for TIM3 in osteoarthritis. So that suggested to us that rather than how much TIM3 is made, instead in osteoarthritis, there's a difference in how it's broken down or recycled. So I started then looking at what causes um, TIM3 to be broken down. So what is the process that normally controls how much TIM3 we have in, in, our, in our knee, our cartilage, or in fact, in any other tissue? And what we found is that in cartilage, the cells make TIM3 and they send it out into their immediate environment. And once it reaches a certain level there, uh, then any excess TIM3 is recycled back into the cell. So how this happens is that TIM3 binds to a recycling label on the cell surface, and it's then taken up into the cell and destroyed. So TIM3 is constantly made and recycled so that there's just enough TIM3 in the right place at the right time. So the important question then was to understand how TIM3 is held in this environment around cells. And we found that it's held there because it binds to sticky chemical groups called sulfations. And these act like a kind of Velcro that um, holds TIM3 as well as some other molecules in this environment around the cell. So the next question was, well, what happens to these sulfations in osteoarthritis? And to understand that, we analyzed uh, cartilage from normal donors as well as uh, from donors with knee osteoarthritis. And we looked at the activity of 38 genes that controlled sulfation around cells. And to our surprise, we found that expression of around 45% of these genes was disrupted. So they were differently active in the osteoarthritis cartilage. And we marked the genes that were more active in osteoarthritis in red and the ones that were less active in blue. And we found that most of these genes that were different in osteoarthritis were actually more active in the osteoarthritic uh, knee cartilage. So what this experiment told us was that these sulfations around cells are very different um, in osteoarthritis. So what we think is that in osteoarthritic cartilage, changes to the sulfation layer around cells mean that it's less able to hold on to TIM3. So, so TIM3 is then released from this area and binds onto the recycling label on the cell surface so that it can it's taken up more and degraded. So there's less TIM3 in the osteoarthritis cartilage. That means the proteases uh, act out of control and they, they're not able to chop up the cartilage and that's what leads to the osteoarthritis. So we're now looking at possible ways to stop this recycling of TIM3. So we're looking at ways in which we can block the breakdown and so um, restore normal levels of TIM3 so that we can stop the uh, cartilage breakdown. We've looked at this process in other tissues as well. So we found that this recycling process also regulates levels of TIM3 in macrophages. So macrophages are really important cells of our immune system. They're important for normal inflammation and immunity. And in these cells, this recycling process of TIMP3 helps keep inflammation at a healthy level. 
And more recently, we've wondered if the same recycling process might also happen in the macula. And the reason we wondered this is because we knew that genetic changes to TIM3 cause Sorsby's macular dystrophy. And many of these genetic changes cause the TIM3 to clump together um, into sort of big aggregates that we thought might be more difficult for the cells um, to recycle. So we wondered if these changes to TIM3 either make it bind differently to the sulfations around the cell or whether they make it bind less or differently um, to the recycling label on the cell surface. So to recap then, we think that in normal cells, there's a carefully controlled balance between the amount of TIMP3 that accumulates outside the cell in the sulfated environment and the amount of TIMP3 that's taken up into the cell and broken down. In osteoarthritis, we think this balance is tipped towards breakdown. So too much TIMP3 is taken up into the cell um, where it's degraded. And in osteoarthritis, we think the main cause of this is changes to the sulfation layer outside of the cell. What we want to look at now is whether um, disturbance in this equilibrium also causes macular dystrophy. So whether we have uh, some disturbance either in the binding of TIMP3 to the sulfations or in its binding to the recycling label. Um, but in either case, um, we want to understand what it is that causes the TIMP3 to accumulate outside of cells uh, in uh, source free macular dystrophy. We um, also wonder if this process is relevant in AMD. And the reason for that is that we know that many of the proteins that accumulate in AMD also bind to these sulfations around the cells. We also know that these sulfations change in many diseases and also with age. So for example, it's been shown that sulfations change with age uh, in the heart and in the brain. And Keenan and co-workers showed that these sulfations also change in the eye with age. So these changes are quite small, um, but we think that over time, these, ch these changes in sulfation that Keenan um, saw could be enough to change how those sulfations around cells hold on to TIM3 and, and other proteins as well. So what we learn in source B macular dystrophy, we think might also help us understand more what happens in age-related macular degeneration. Last year, we were awarded a PhD studentship by the Macular Society to look at these four questions. So firstly, we want to understand what is the role of the recycling label on the cells in the macula. So is this recycling label also responsible for TIM3 uptake in the macula? And we want to know if the source piece macular dystrophy versions of TIM3 are taken up differently by this recycling label. Secondly, we want to know um, what is the role of the sulfations around the cells. So do these sulfations also protect T3 from uptake in the macula? Uh, and is it possible that the Sorsby's macular dystrophy versions of T3 bind differently to these sulfations, or perhaps they bind to something else in the environment? And thirdly, we want to know what effect Sorsby's macular dystrophy versions of T3 have on retinal cells. So are they toxic to these cells, and if so, how? And lastly, we want to look at whether or not this recycling process also happens in AMD. So are other proteins that accumulate in AMD controlled by this pathway? And is there some difference either in the recycling labels or in the sulfations as we age uh, that leads to AMD? So Jacob Betts from the University of Oxford uh, joined my group in October last year to look at these questions. So Jacob joined us from uh, St. Hilda's College at the University of Oxford. And Jacob's made great progress in making the instructions that tell cells how to make either normal TIMP3 or the Sorsby's macular dystrophy versions of TIMP3. And he's introduced these into cells uh, and um, he's also isolated that TIMP3 from the cells. And this really is quite a, uh, a tricky task because TIMP3 really is um, not the easiest protein to work with, it's quite sticky but um, Jacob's made great uh, progress with that. And one of the first things we saw is that the retinal cells don't seem to like making these Sorsby's macular dystrophy versions of TIM3. So Jacob introduced the instructions for either normal TIM3 or two um, 
SMD variants of TIM3 into these cells. And then we looked at how, how much TIM3 the cells made. So we stained the TIM3 with a green label that enables us to um, follow it. And what we found was that the cells made much more of the normal TIM3 than of two uh, source based macular dystrophy versions of TIM3. So we call these Y191C and S204C um, based on the particular genetic change that, uh, that happens with these two proteins. Um, we had hoped to do a number of experiments using this kind of technique where we introduce the DNA into the cell and get the cell to make either the normal or the altered version of TIM3. But this experiment told us that that isn't gonna work um, because the cells make such different amounts of the TIM3 that we can't really compare their activity directly. Uh, so um, I guess this shouldn't have surprised us because science is never um, simple or easy. Uh, but what it's told us is that we're going to have to isolate the TIM3, um, so, so um, purify it away from the other components of the cells, and then standardize the amount of TIM3 that we give back to the cells so that we can compare them directly. So to do that, Jacob has been isolating um, normal and uh, variant forms of TIM3. So he uses some special beads that he puts in a, um, in a tube and these beads are able to fish out the TIM3 from the cell extracts. And if we look at um, the different um, um, parts that come off these beads, um, we can see that Jacob has successfully isolated the TIM3. And now we can uh, standardize the amount that we add back to cells um, so that we can compare them directly. And we're just starting to look at the uptake of TIM3, both the normal and the variant forms of TIM3 by retinal pigment epithelial cells. And to do this, we add the TIM3 into the environment around the cell. And then over time, we um, take samples to look at how much TIM3 is still present uh, in that environment. And what we see is that the amount of TIM3 around cells drops over time. So that's as they take it up and break it down. And um, if we look at how fast this happens, um, we can see it's, it's happening in the same way that we saw in the uh, chondrocytes when we looked at osteoarthritis. And if anything, it's happening a little bit faster in these retinal cells, which is quite interesting. Uh, so we're just at the process now, uh, just at the point now where we're starting to compare the normal TIM3 with the Sorsby's macular dystrophy versions of TIM3. So hopefully I can tell you a little bit more about that um, next year. So to recap then, we think that the same mechanism controls the amount of TIM3 in the joint and in the macula, and that this process is disrupted both in osteoarthritis and in macular dystrophy. In Sorsby's macular dystrophy, we think this disruption happens because of genetic changes in TIM3. Whereas in osteoarthritis and AMD, we think that changes uh, that happen in our body as we age alter either the accumulation of TIM3 outside of the cell so changes in that sulfation layer mean that TIM3 either binds more or less um, outside of the cell. And the other thing that can happen um, that we're testing in um, source B macular dystrophy and AMD is whether or not the recycling label is changed as we age. So we're hoping that by understanding this process in more detail, um, we'll be able to develop therapies that can restore this equilibrium and mean that um, we have the right amount of TIM3 outside of our cells at the right time. So we're currently uh, developing um, new therapies for osteoarthritis. Of course, we'll need different ones for the, for the macula, but we're hoping that once we can understand the process that happens, this will help us uh, design strategies to restore the TIM3 equilibrium. So thank you to everyone in the lab who's um, helping with this work, in particular Jacob Betts, and we are collaborating very closely with Tony Day, who's a co-supervisor of this project at the University of Manchester. Thank you for listening, and thank you also to the Natural Society, of course, for their support, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you.